Good afternoon and welcome to Homework Hotline. I'm Robert Vriesman and I'm here for the math segment of Homework Hotline. Today I'm going to be working with a few interesting problems. One of them has to do with some acid solutions, a little geometry and then a little work with charts. I took it off the PSAT test. And now Wilfred Smith. Yes, and I'm Wilfred Smith. I'm also here for the math segment. Now today I'll be solving a system of equations in three variables and also uh, some general problem solving, that is solving word problems. But before we get started, let's go to one of our English teachers, Deborah Games Matthews at the phones and see what kinds of calls are coming in. Deborah. Thanks, Wilfred. I'm Deborah Gaines Matthews. Just listen to those phones answered by our homework hotline teleteachers. And next week, <coughs> Um, the Teleteacher will be a Teleteacher Appreciation Week. You'll get to meet some of the people who answer your calls. That should be a lot of fun, so be sure to call us. If you have an English question, call. Ask for me. Maybe we can do your problem live on the air. English comes on at 5 o'clock, so stay tuned now for 30 Minutes of Math with Robert and Wilford. Thank you, Deborah. Remember, you can call in your questions simply by calling 1-800-527-8839 or just dial 1-800-LA-STUDY. The call is free, the help is free. So what are you waiting for? And now here's Robert. Thank you, Wilfred. All right, look at these problems on the board. Before I get started, I would like to introduce someone by the name of Myra. Myra, can you hear me? Yes. All right. And can you see these nice little jars and beakers on your television screen at home? Yes. Okay. They're going to help us do this problem, okay? Okay. Now, can you see this problem well enough to read it to the millions of people out there that are watching? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Craig has 2.5 liter of solution, which is 70% acid. How much water should be added to get a 50% acid solution? All right. Myra, if, it, if this solution is 70% acid, then what percent is not acid? 30. That's exactly right. Now, I want to use that. That's going to be the, the water, all right? And I want to work this problem in terms of the water. OK, do you understand? Mm -hmm. All right. So in other words, uh, even though this, this right here is 70% acid, it's also 30% water, all right? And what we have here is 2.5 liters, all right? So I'll just label that with 2.5 liters of acid. And again, it's 70% acid, but we want to remember that it's also 30% water, okay? Okay. All right. Now, what we want to add is water, all right? So we're, we're going to imagine some water right in here. We'll just go like this, H2O. But we don't know how much water to add, do we? So since we don't know, what do we call in algebra what it is that we don't know? The variable. The variable. And what, what shall we use? A X. A X is always a good choice. So we're going to call that X, all right? Okay. Now, what we need to do is to combine this water with this, with this solution that we have already, right? Right. All right. And when we combine it, we're going to, get, we're going to put it in this larger jug, so it's going to be the X plus that 2.5 liters. It'll be the water plus the acid solution that we have already. You with me? Yes. OK. Now, remember we want to talk about this in terms of the water, OK? OK. In, in terms of the water. And we said that this was 30% water. So I'm going to change that 30% to a decimal, which we can just write as 0.3, OK? OK. All right. Now, what about the water? What percent? water of water is water. Water is 100% water. water. Yeah. So we can just, we can change this to just a 1 right here. Well, we don't have to change it to anything. It's all water, okay? Okay. It's all water. And we said that when we get done, when we, after we've combined our two, our acid solution and our water, what, what percentage do we want? 50. 50%. So if 50% of it is acid, that means that 50% of it will be the, the water. Right. See, right now, what's in this beaker is 70% acid and 30% water. When we end up, we want 50% water and 50% acid. Do you understand? Yes. OK. So I'm going to put right in front of this, this jug a 0.5 because 50% is the same thing as 0.5. I just changed the percent to a decimal, okay? Okay. 
Okay. Now, if you think of the, these jars up here, if you think of the jars just as a set of parentheses, then we can just work this as an equation, okay? Okay. All right. Now, can you multiply 0.3 times 2.5? That's a little tough to do in your head, so I'm going to help you, okay? 0.75? Very good. <laughs> it's 0 0.75, all right? Now, we want to add 1x to that, all right? Okay. So we can put 1x, or we can just put x. It, it doesn't matter, but, but I'm going to put 1.0x, because we're going to be working with some decimals, and I want to show a decimal there, okay? Okay. All right. Now we need to multiply this last little part of the equation, and can you tell me what to write? 0.5x yes. plus 1.25, okay? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, all we're doing is finding half of 2.5, so that's going to be 1.25, all right? Okay. Okay. Now what do we do, Myra? Uh, we change the x, the 0.5x to the other side. Okay. We're going to subtract 0.5x from this side, and if we do it from this side, we have to subtract 0.5x from this side. Okay. Now you tell me what to write. Okay. Um, 0.75. Okay, 0 0.75. Are you using a calculator? 0.5x. Okay. 0.5x. Equals. Equals, because one, the... Mm -hmm. Right. Cancel. 1.25. Okay, 1.25. Now what do we do? Now we, we subtract the 0.75 and put it to the other side. All right. And we put it to the other side. And we get 5, oh, we get 0.5. 0 0.5x. Equals to 0.5. No, careful. Oh. It's just going to be 0 0.5, isn't it? So yeah, 0.5. Okay. Now we divide it by 0.5. Okay. 0.5. We divide both sides by 0.5. And how many times does 0.5 go into 0.5? One time. Once. So how many liters of water do we have to add? One. 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 One liter. All right, let's read the problem to make sure we have an answer here, okay? okay. Going back to the problem. Craig had 2.5 liters of solution, which is 70% acid, which also means it's 30% water, right? How much water should be added to get a 50% acid solution? And our, the answer to our problem is one liter. Okay? Okay. You follow that? Mm -hmm. Now, Myra, I want you to hang around a little bit because I want you to help me with this geometry problem. Do you mind? It's okay, okay. Okay. Can you see this on your own television screen at home? Yes. All right. It says in the figure below, S is parallel to T. In other words, this line right here is parallel to this line right here. What is the value of X plus Y plus W plus Z? Do you remember what this line is called? A line that crosses two parallel lines? You know what that line is called, Myra? The transversal? Excellent. It's called the transversal. That's exactly right. Now, these angles right here, what are these angles called? Vertical? They're vertical angles. And what do we know about vertical angles? That they have the same value? They have exactly the same value. So we know that the x is equal to the y, right? right? Now what can you tell me about this angle x right here and this angle right here? Are they also equal angles? Yes, they Yes, they are. This measure here. So I could also label this as x, couldn't I? Yes. Yeah. And what about this angle right here and this angle right there? They're the same. They're the same thing. So if this is, is Y, I could also label this one Y, couldn't I? Mm -hmm. Now, what can you tell me about this angle right here? What does that equal? How many degrees does that, does that equal? In other Lighting? words... Oh, careful. Careful. See, look at it if, it if it were a straight line like this. How many degrees is it like that? Oh. 180. 180. So th this is a straight line. All I've, all I've done is take this line here and turned it like that. So this is also going to be 180. 180. That's right. And then how many degrees is it around this way? 180. 180. That means that x plus y plus w plus z must equal? 180. No. <laughs> x? No. All of them together. x plus y plus w plus z. All of them together 
Doesn't that look like a circle around there 360. now? 360. Exactly. Okay, so the sum of x plus y plus w plus z has to be 360 degrees. All right? All right. All right. Now, here's an interesting little problem that I took from, from an old version of the PSAT test, okay? Okay. Now, it says, well, you want to read it to the thousands of people that are out there? Okay. How many different assignments of three compers, Alice, Barbara, and Connie to the two tenths picture below are possible if each ten must contain at least one of these compers? All right. So, so we'll call this one tent one right here, okay? And this one over here we'll call tent two. All right? Now, if, if we put Alice in this tent right here, Myra, who has to be in that tent over there? Barbara. Barbara and Connie. Okay? See, there's, there's three people all together, Alice, Barbara, and Connie. Now, we have to put all three of those campers in a tent, but at least one of them, there has to be at least one person in each tent, all right? All right. Now, if we put A here, B and C have to be there. How about if we put B here? Who has to be in the other tent? A. A and who else? A and C. A and C, or Alice and Connie, all right? Now let's put Connie all by herself in this tent number one. Who has to be in tent two? A and B. A and B, or Alice and Barbara. All right, now let's, let's pair them up in this tent over here. How about if we put Alice and Barbara in tent one? Who goes in tent two? C. Connie, Connie, C. Connie, yeah. Connie. Okay. Are you beginning to see the pattern that we're doing here? Uh-huh. See, all, all we have to do is say, okay, if A is in here, that means B and C is in, are here. If B is here, that means A and C have to be here. If C is here, A and B have to be here. Now we're going to start putting the, the two people in this first tent, okay? All right. And, and that's what we've done so far. So we've used A, B. Now what should we use? Uh, B, C. We could, okay, I, I have AC, so we'll do AC, so that means who's over here? Barbara. Barbara. All right. Now, what is our other choice? You just said it a second ago. BC. BC, BC which means that? Connie. Oh, Connie's over here. Oh, so Connie. Oh, Alex. So this has to be Alice. Now, are there any other possibilities? Are there any other possibilities? Nope. I don't think so either. So, how many different assignments of three campers, Alice, Barbara, and Connie, to the two tenths picture below are possible? There are six different possibilities for arranging these two if each tent must contain at least one of these campers. Okay? Okay. I'm, I, uh, Wilf if Wilfred's ready, I, I've run out of problems today. So, if uh, Wilfred, are you all set to go? Uh, that's correct. All right. <clears throat> that's, all that, that's all I have for today. So, let's go over to Wilfred Smith. Thank you. My first question is a problem, it's a system of equation problem, and it comes from Philip, who's a ninth grade student at Mesa Robles. And this is Philip's problem, and it reads, 2x plus 3y minus 2z equals 4, 3x minus 2y plus 2z equals 16, negative x minus 12y plus 8z equals 5. And naturally, we're to try to find x, y, and z. Now, we are used to solving system of equations in just two variables. But the procedure that we use for two variables also works for three variables. We are going to eliminate some of the variables. We are going to eliminate some of the variables. Uh, for example, we could try to get rid of the z's from the equations and then solve for x and y in the normal fashion. If we look at these equations, let's call these 1, 2, and 3 respectively. If you look at the equations 1 and 2, you'll notice that they both have the same coefficient in magnitude on the z's, yet the signs are different. So if we were to add those two equations together, the z's would drop out, and we would just have x and y. And so we're going to eliminate the z's to begin. 
And so if we combine those two, 2x plus 3y minus 2z equals 4, 3x minus 2y plus 2z equals 16. And we just simply add these two together. The z's will drop out. This now becomes 5x plus y equals 20. And so now we have an equation in just two variables, x and y. Now, since we got rid of the z's, uh, let's try and eliminate the z's again from two other equations. How about if we combine equation number two with equation number three in some fashion to get rid of the z's? Let me write equation number three to begin. It is negative x minus 12y plus 8z equals 5. And now let's take a look at equation number two. If I take equation, well, actually, it would be easier if we just simply went up to equation number one because the sign on the z was already negative. So I'm going to use equation number one instead. Now notice here we have a negative 2z. Now, if we multiply this first equation by 4, then the coefficient on the z would now be negative 8. And that would cancel out with a positive 8 in equation number 3. So I'm going to multiply this first equation by 4. That is, multiply each of the terms by 4. So 4 times 2x is 8x. 4 times 3y is, of course, 12y. And 4 times negative 2z is negative 8z, and 4 times 4 is 16. Now, we have these two equations, and if we simply add them together, notice that the z's drop out. But also, there's an added bonus in this, in that the y's also drop out, because we have a negative 12y, and then we have a positive 12y. So the y's also drop out, which is very neat. And so what are we left with? We're left with a negative x plus an 8x, which is 7x. And then we're just simply adding. So 7x equals 21. Now that's a simple equation. And so we can now divide both sides by 7. And so we find that x equals 3. Now this was somewhat of a surprise to get rid of the y so quickly, but that's beautiful. We have found a value for x. x is 3. And I'm just going to write it at the top to remind me as I go through. So x is 3. Now, we also need to find y. So I'm going to take this value for x, x being 3, and substitute it into this derived equation, 5x plus y equals 20. And so, in the equation, 5x plus y equals 20. I'm going to replace the x with a 3. So that gives me 5 times 3 plus y equals 20, or 15 plus y equals 20. And if I now subtract 15 from both sides, 15 drop out, and so y is equal to 5. And so I found the value for y, and that is y is equal to 5. Now we have found two values. We have found the value of x, and we have found the value for y. We must also find the value for z. And to find the value for z, we're simply going to go back to one of these equations and just substitute the values that we have found for x and y and uh, find out what z is equal to. And I'm going to cho choose equation number 2 on this one and substitute into this equation the values for x and y that we have found. And what have we found? So we're using 3x minus 2y plus 2z equals 16. And in place of x, we're going to write a 3. So that gives us 3 times 3. That's the value for x that we found, minus 2 times the value for y which was, of course, 5. And this, of course, is equal to uh, weight plus our 2z. That is equal to 16. OK. 3 times 3 is 9. 2 times 5 is 10, so that's 9 minus 10 plus 2z equals 16. This is now negative 1 
plus 2z equals 16. And to get rid of that negative 1, we simply add 1 to both sides of the equation. The 1's drop out. We get 2z equals 17. Now to find z, we simply divide by 2. And so z is 17 over 2. Or if you want to write it as a mixed number, you can write it as 8 and 1 half. So I'm going to write z equals 17 over 2. Now, we have solved for x, y, and z. And again, a pro especially a problem like this, you need to check your answers to make sure that the numbers that you found, the values that you found, satisfy each and every equation that was given to you. And so we're going to check those values into each equation one by one. If we look at the first equation, 2x plus 3y minus 2z equals 4. And now we're going to substitute 3 for x, 5 for y, and 17 over 2 for z, and to see if it works out. So in place of the x, we're going to substitute a 3. And in place of the y, we're going to substitute a 5. And in place of the z, we're going to substitute 17 over 2. The question is, will all of that turn out to be 4? That's the check. Well, 2 times 3 is 6. And 3 times 5 is, of course, 15. Now, here we have 2 times 17 over 2. And the 2's cancel. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, that we don't worry to write it as a mixed number, because when we're checking, we still have to convert it back to a fraction. So this is simply negative 17. Is that equal to 4? Well, five plus, um, 6 plus 15 is 21. So 21 minus 17, is that 4? Yes. 4 is equal to 4. So the first equation checks. So far, the values look good. It says, ah, x is 3, y is 5, and z is 17 over 2. But those values must fit every one of the equations that we started out with. So now we're going to check it into equation number 2. Let's see if it works for equation number 2. We have 3x minus 2y plus 2z equals 16. Again, 3 times 3, that's the value of x, minus 2 times 5, that's the value of y, plus 2 times z, that's the value of 17 over 2. Is that equal to 16? This time it should be equal to 16. Well, let's see. 3 times 3 is 9. This is, of course, negative 10. And again, 2 times 17 over 2 is just simply 17. Is that 16? And remember, 9 minus 10 is negative 1 plus 17. Negative 1 plus 17 is 16. So that one checks. So we've checked out the first two equations. And let's quickly do the last equation. So far, so good. The last equation. On the last equation, we have negative x minus 12y plus 8z should equal 5. OK, again, x is a, a 3, so that gives us negative 3 minus 12 times y, which is 5, plus 8 times 17 over 2. The question is, is that one equal to 5? All right. This is negative 3. 12 times 5 is 60, so it becomes negative 60. And now, as we cancel, 2 goes into 8 four times. And now we have 4 times uh, 17. So that is plus 4 7 is 28. 4 1 is 4 and 2 is 6. So uh, am I right? 4, yes, that is uh, 6 to 8. And now, is that equal to 5? Well, negative 3 plus a negative 60 is a negative 63 plus our 6 to 8, is that equal to 5? Well, negative 6 to 3 and a positive 6 to 8 is in fact 5. 
and so it checks. Therefore, our original answer that we had, x equals 3, y equals 5, and z equals 17 over 2. My next question is a very interesting word problem, and this one came from Tamika, who's a 10th grade student at Washington High School. And her problem reads, a water tank weighs 240 metric tons when 40% full and 300 metric tons uh, when, uh, okay, and, and 300 metric, okay, let me start over. A water tank weighs 240 metric tons when 40% full and 300 metric tons when completely full. So there's an expression that's missing here. When completely full. Okay. Now, and then the question was, how much does it weigh when empty? So we are given uh, the weight at 40%. We're given the weight when it is completely full. And we want to find the weight of the tank itself. Now, let's do this. Let us let x be the weight of the tank. And let's let y be the weight of the water. Now, what do we know? When it is 40% full, then you have the tank plus 40% is 400, so 4 tenths. Uh, so we could write this as 4 tenths of y, and that will now be equal to 240. When it is completely full, we have the weight of the tank plus the weight, the total weight of the water, and that is now 300. All right, if we multiply the first equation by 10, we have 10x plus 4y equals 2400. Now, we want to find the weight of the tank when it is empty. So let's multiply the second equation by 4. So that gives us 4x plus 4y equals 1,200. Now we want to get rid of the y's, so we're going to subtract. So we change all of these signs. The y's drop out. We find that 6x equals 1,200. And if we divide by 6, then we find that x equals 200. That x in metric tons is the weight of the tank when it is empty. So the weight of the tank when it is empty is now 200 metric tons. Now my time is up, but don't go away because coming up next is 30 minutes of English, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Angela Hewlett Block and, and I'm Deborah Gaines Matthews and today um, I'm going to be completing a capitalization drill that I started last week with Felicia and hopefully she'll be able to continue with me today. Um, in addition, I'll be giving tips for correcting usage problems in speaking and writing as well as agreement problems and if I have time, maybe even spelling tips. What are you going to do today, Angela? Uh, today for the first uh, half of the English segment, I'm going to talk about figurative language. Mm -hmm. I have a little tidbit about um, uh, Veterans Day, which is today. I know some okay. people have celebrated it mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. And uh, do those kinds of things. So that's uh, uh, what I have going on. And uh, I'll get started. Okay. <laughs> okay. The first thing I have uh, really has uh, nothing to do with figurative language, but it has a little bit to do with um, 
what today is. Today is November 11th. We know that it's Veterans Day. Many of you were uh, out of school or on vacation on Monday and have celebrated already. Others in uh, the government offices are celebrating today. So I'd like you to uh, take a look at this. I pulled this out of my Word a Day um, uh, calendar and uh, this is it's great. It's helping uh, increase my vocabulary because I learn a new word every day or am reminded of a word maybe that I knew before. This one, uh, this word um, manticle uh, happens to mean a little hill. And I'll read the sentence for you because the type is uh, pretty small. Three of the bloodiest days in American history occurred in July of 1863 at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania as federal and confederate forces battled for control of Round Top, Little Round Top, Cemetery Ridge, and other monticles whose very insignificance stood in sharp contrast to the massive human toil. Okay, so there we have, um, this is really a, a nice example of how um, in you know, just something as mundane as a calendar can be an aid in um, uh, increasing your vocabulary and teaching you uh, something about American history. So, uh, and as you see at the bottom here, it is Veterans Day and uh, just that little bit of information. So you might want to um, uh, go out and grab one of these little calendars. Uh, today I'm going to talk about figurative language. Figurative language, first of all, if you want to take a look here, is, uh, are words that do not mean exactly what they seem to say. And I will give you a few examples um, if that sounds a little bit confusing. Figurative language makes comparisons that when taken word for word are not really true. So when you look closely at these um, examples of figurative language, they sound a little unusual, particularly for um, students or those who are not um, uh, natives of this country and are, and are not clued into these figures of speech. They find them very unusual. Let's look at this example. This headache is killing me. Okay, now many of you have suffered from headaches before um, and maybe you thought you were going to die, but uh, the literal meaning or the comparison is not uh, uh, really, really true. Okay, so it's an exaggeration for this one. Um, let's take a look at the next one. He was really in the dark. There's your figure of speech, really in the dark when we were discussing the Civil War. Okay, do it doesn't mean literally that the lights were out. All right, but that uh, maybe uh, this person did not know anything about the Civil War. So you get an example, a uh, couple here of what uh, figurative, um, ex uh, figurative language is and how it works. I found a little cartoon here that I'd like to show you that deals um, a bit with uh, figurative language, sort of. Take a look at this little cartoon here and make sure I have it. If you can see uh, the picture here, we have the, uh, the guy looking at the um, uh, TV screen, his arms are up, evidently watching football, right? Looks like he's making the field goal, field goal um, uh, sign. And we have the, probably the wife walking out, and what's he saying? Go, 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 all right? And probably not literally, we're, we're presuming that he's not uh, literally asking her to go, but um, we can see how uh, the meaning of those words um, are, are, are misperceived. So let's take a look at a, a few more examples, some that you are probably very familiar with and others uh, that I found that are maybe uh, older than 50 years old. Okay, So let's take a look at this next set of examples here. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, if you want to take a look at the sheet. Um, this one we know is um, uh, overused, which is often the case with many of these figures of speech. Uh, this one may have been appropriate in some areas today. It was raining cats and dogs. Okay? And maybe some of you, um, and, and we know that, again, the literal meaning is not actually cats and dogs. It was raining what? It was raining very, very hard. Uh, letter C, you have knocked me over with a feather. Okay, now that, um, uh, what do you think maybe uh, they're saying there? Possibly that uh, a, a bit of information or maybe not such a great amount of information was able to uh, bowl this person over, okay? Or maybe the person is won over easily. Letter D, these people have money to burn. 
Uh, many of you uh, youngsters may hear your parents tell you, you think I have money to burn. What are they saying? That I don't have that much money that I can just throw it in a pile and burn it. Those people have money to burn suggest possibly that they're maybe very wealthy, um, uh, do throw money away, literally. She eats like a bird. Okay? And um, in this instance, when um, uh, generally this particular uh, figure of speech usually uh, refers to someone who doesn't eat very much, unlike um, uh, vul vultures, for example. We know that eat quite a bit. Um, now, I, I found a set of um, examples here that I took from a story. So they're uh, a little bit out of context, but you, I, I pulled these out because you will find these oftentimes in uh, your reading and in your studying. And it's important that you recognize figures of speech so that you understand what the author is, is talking about and referring to. For example, the character in this story was Helen Stoner. She looks like a hunted animal. So if you can imagine what Helen may be looking like, maybe frightened. scared, a hunted animal. Maybe she's um, backed into a corner, okay? Maybe shivering, okay? Or maybe a, a worried look on her face. Um, I took out the second one because it was a little too obscure. I didn't think it would be appropriate. Uh, number three here, that's easy. It's all burned in my memory. If something is burned into your memory, then it's, it's there, it's, it's solid, it's something that you're not going to forget. Um, if you can imagine uh, being branded with a memory, that's what this particular figure of speech is referring to. Um, the next one, some of you may have found yourself in this situation. We're in deep waters here, if you want to take a look at this one. In deep waters, meaning that um, you are really uh, possibly in trouble. And one more of these um, uh, from this particular story. I think we can wrap things up along those lines, okay? Wrap things up. Okay, we're going to draw it to a close, okay? And which I will be doing with this segment very shortly. I will be wrapping things up. Um, uh, on, the, uh, on the TV screen when they want us to uh, sometimes wind it up. So you can see this gesture, all right? They're telling us, or, or they might be telling me to uh, hurry up, wind it up, okay? Wrap it up, Angela, and, and move on. Okay, um, now a few more um, uh, figures of speech that are much older that you might not be familiar with that you may hear or uh, may read. So let's take a look at these. If your coat tail catches fire, don't wait till you see the blaze before you put it out. Okay, so it's a, a figure of speech, but also a bit of uh, uh, some moralizing there. Um, uh, what is the, the message in this one? Uh, don't wait too long. If you see something bad happening, don't wait until it gets too bad before you do something about it. This one has a picture to go along with it, fortunately, if you can see that number two. Okay, there we go. The lean hound, a lean hound, leads the pack when the rabbit is in sight. Okay? Notice the difference between this guy right here and this one. And hopefully you can see my arrows here. Make these real dark. Okay? What's the difference? Okay, the second one is a little bit uh, chunkier here. Let me move him over so you can see a little better. Okay, the lean one. So this one. Um, uh, taken from a while back, suggesting that if you're leaner, then maybe you're stronger and faster. Okay? We can tell that this one is a bit um, archaic. Number three, ripe apples make the tree look taller. Okay, what do you think about that one? Possibly um, if they have uh, prettier flowers, maybe it looks better, it looks stronger. The noises of the wheels don't measure the load in the wagon. Okay? Um, so, and uh, there's another one that's uh, similar to this um, uh, about a squeaky wheel that you may have heard before, okay? It doesn't uh, necessarily mean that um, the noisiest one is the best one or that it has the most. Number five, hogs that are getting fat aren't in for luck, okay? And maybe this one could have something to do with that uh, number two up there about the, uh, the lean dogs that we uh, talked about before. 
Um, life is short and full of blisters. Any of you ever had blisters on your hands <laughs> or, uh, or on your feet? It's short and full of blisters. What does that mean? Short with maybe uh, some pain and some problems. Number seven. If you want to see how much folks are going to miss you, just stick your finger in the pond, then pull it out and look at the hole. What kind of hole do you find in a pond when you pull your finger out? None. Okay, so that's, um, that one's uh, uh, maybe talking about um, how important we are, suggesting maybe our lack of importance um, in the world uh, or in life. Not a real positive uh, message there. Number eight. One person can thread a needle better than two. Okay. Um, uh, again, the idea of uh, too many hands in the broth. Number nine, the billy goat gets hit hardest when he looks like he's going to back out of a fight. Okay. And we know how uh, uh, billy goats fight. Okay. So if he's backing out, then we know what's going to happen to him. Nothing looks good on a miserable man. Right, and maybe you felt sometimes when, if we, if we make it very uh, mundane and every day, when you're getting ready in the morning and uh, you're, you're putting things on and nothing looks correct, sometimes it's the inside that's not feeling so wonderful. Okay, I have a few more quickies that I'm going to run through real quick without explanation because you'll probably uh, know what they are uh, just before Deborah comes on. Here are a few more uh, figures of speech that we see every day. Uh, you may... Um, uh, something uh, stuck to the roof of the mouth. Now this could be um, a liter literal or um, uh, maybe something is on the tip of your tongue, for example. The arm of the chair. Okay, notice what we're doing here. We are applying human qualities to something inanimate. Um, if we extended this a bit, um, uh, some of you may know this word, personification. Okay. There you go. Um, the foot of the bed, again, human quality to something inanimate. He was really in the doghouse. Some of you may uh, know the exact meaning of this when you're in trouble. Because possibly you were barking up the wrong tree, as a result, we'll have to give him the ax. He saw red, he blew his top, and he was told to take a hike. Okay, so you have lots of examples and some fun examples of figures of speech. That's it for me today. Uh, it's time for Deborah with 15 more minutes of English. Thank you, Angela. Like I said, I'm going to be doing a variety of, a variety of things that basically have to do with grammar. Um, and I should have Felicia on the line. Felicia, are you there? Yes. Okay, Felicia, I know that you called last week and at the very end of my segment, we started doing a capitalization drill that we weren't able to finish. So I just wanted to have you to help me to complete that and then maybe you'll help, help me do a few other things. If you could follow me over to the, to the homework cam. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we started, we started last week and I believe we completed number one. I believe we completed number one and a couple others, but let's just go through them a, a second time for the benefit of those students that are watching. Okay, um, last week we said <clears throat> these two sentences. Can you see them, Felicia? Barely. Very, you can't see them? Barely. Okay, barely. Okay, um, well, when we speak of capital, capitalization, it's very important because it's a signal to the reader and it's a signal for emphasis and for understanding as well. So it's very important that when we're writing, um, we learn and memorize the rules so that we can um, have these correct signals to our readers. Okay, now um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read this to you and um, hopefully you'll be able to understand the difference here. Okay, this was one that we did last week. It said, her shop, okay, we have two variations of the same sentence and we're trying to figure out which one is actually correct in terms of the capitalization. Okay, sentence 1A, her shop is on Union Street in San Francisco, and sentence B says the same thing. The only difference is the capitalization of San Francisco. So which one would be correct? Can, um, can you see that difference there, Felicia, in sentence A and B? Yes. Okay, which one would be correct? A. Okay, A, and last week you told us the reason being that we would select A would be what? Because um, San Francisco was a 
capitalized. Okay, it's capitalized because you told us last week, Felicia, that it's the na that it's the name of a specific place. So uh, this is the reason that we would capitalize capitalize it. Okay, now I've checked off a few others here. Okay, number three is very easy. If you can take a look at that, can you see that? I've um, put this paper under number three. Okay, very simple. It says he lives in Texas, and the only difference here in both sentences is that we have Texas being uh, one is capitaliz capitaliz capitalized in A, and then in uh, sentence B, it isn't capitalized. So we know which one would be correct, Felicia. Cap, I mean, letter A. Sentence A, exactly, because it's the name of a specific place. Okay, it's a specific place, and we're talking about states here. Okay, and the same thing for B, okay, and here we have um, a continent. So I'm not going to go through letter B, but let's look at number six. Okay, if I can guide you to see that. Can you see it, Felicia, number six? Yes. Okay. Would you read it? Summers in the southeast are often humid. Yes. Okay, yes. Summers in the southeast are often humid. So we see that the difference here is southeast, um, the capitalization. Which one would you think is correct, Felicia, A or B? Letter B. Letter B, okay, and why would you say that? Why? Because you're talking about a specific area. Okay, exactly. We're talking about a place, a geographical location, like the states that are in the southeastern portion. Okay, so we would need to capitalize that. Um, <clears throat> let's go on to number seven. Okay, just a few others. Uh, okay, let me just guide you to see number seven. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, why don't you read it for us? Yellowstone National Park is in Wyoming. Okay, and notice that the only difference here is that in, in sentence A, park is capitalized, and in sentence B, it isn't. Which one would you say is correct? Letter A. Letter A, and why is that? Tell us the rule. Because it's talking about a specific place. Okay, well, that, yes, but the reason being is that Yellowstone National Park, this is the name of a national park. Park is a part of the name. Okay, and since park is a part of the name, you would need to capita capitalize that as well. Okay, so sentence A would be the correct answer. Let's move on very quickly. What about number eight? Let me see if you can see that. Okay, number eight. Can you see number eight? Yes. Okay, why don't you read it for us? The city of Richmond is the capital of Virginia. Virginia. <clears throat> okay, and notice that the difference here is uh, between the the word city here. Which one would you say is correct? Version A or version B? A. Version A? Well, why would you say that? Why did you choose A? Why did you choose version A, Felicia? Because it's describing a, a place. Well, okay, you're probably thinking that from sentence seven, we said that Park was a part of the name, Yellowstone National Park. And because park was a part of the name, we had to capitalize it. Well, here, city is, is not a part of the name here. So this is the reason why in this sentence, we would actually choose version A as the one that's correct, because city is not a part of the name. When we say Yellowstone National Park, that's a part of the name. We wouldn't say city of, of Richmond as its actual name. We can just say Richmond and we will mean the city. Okay, so in that case, we would need to select B. Okay, do you understand that, Felicia? Yes. Okay, let's move on to just a few others. I just checked off a few. Um, let's look at number, number 11. Okay, why don't you read it for us? We must protect our state parks. Okay, and notice here, these are the words that we need to decide between. Okay, which version of the sentence would you select as being correct? A. A? Okay, we must protect our state parks. Now, is this the name of a specific park, Felicia? No. No, so since it isn't the name of a specific park, then what we would need to do is we would need to select version B. Okay, if it was the name of a specific park, um, we would definitely need to capitalize capitalize the names, but since it isn't, we would select version B. Okay, what about number 12? Okay, we just have a few others. What about number 12? Why don't you read it for us? I will be at 42nd Street and Park Avenue. Okay, 42nd Street, Street and Park Avenue. Notice the difference here. We have 
second. Okay, this is what we need to decide between. Which version of the sentence would you select as being correct? A. A. Well, <clears throat> this is a mistake that many students make. Now, let me tell you the rule, and hopefully you'll be able to, you and everyone else watching will be able to remember this rule. And that is that whenever you have a hyphenated number, such as 42nd, the first letter of the second word needs to be lowercase all the time, okay? So in that case, we would need to select which version of the sentence? B. B, okay, why don't you just restate that rule for us? And this is very important because as we go through learning the rules, as we go through learning the rules, <clears throat> just memor memorization and practice helps us to know uh, which version as we're writing, which word should be capitalized and which word shouldn't. Okay, what, what is that rule, Felicia, the one that we just stated for sentence 12 and 42nd? When you remember talking about a hyphen number, the second, the first cap, the first letter of the second number should always be lowercase. Exactly. Okay, exactly. Um, let's just go through just a couple of other sentences and we're going to be finished, Felicia. Okay, what about number four, yes, number 14? Why don't you read it for us? The North Sea is east of Great Britain. Okay. Which version of this sentence would you select? Notice here we have East capitalized in sentence A, and it isn't capitalized in sentence B. Letter B. You would choose letter B. Okay, very good. Why would you say that? Because um, East is, we're talking about a direction and not a specific place, and Great Brit Britain was not capitalized. Okay, exactly. And one of the key things that you said that some, some students forget is that we do not capitalize uh, directions. We do capitalize geographic locations. Uh, we're talking about the east or the west. If we're talking about those places, we do need to capitalize them. But if we're not, if we're talking about directions, we do not need to capitalize. Okay, let's see. I think this is the last sentence, Felicia. Number 15. Okay, why don't you read it for us? Is that Atlanta? Yes, it is. Atlanta is a first fast, fast growing city in the south. Okay, and here we have what we need to decide uh, here. Okay, which, which version of the sentence would you choose? A or B, Felicia? Letter A. Letter A. Well, Atlanta says Atlanta is a fast growing city in the south. So we're talking about. A, exactly. We're talking about a place. We're talking about southern states. Okay, so that being the case, we would need to select which version? B. B. Okay, Felicia. Oh, wait a minute. We do have one other. Let's look at 17, and then we're definitely finished, Felicia. Okay, read number 17. The Hawaiian. I can't see that. You can't, okay, it says islands. The Hawaiian islands. The island. Hawaiian islands are southwest of California. Okay, very good. Um, here we have southwest. <coughs> uh oh, excuse me. Southwest is not capitalized in sentence A, but it is capitalized in sentence B. Which version of the sentence would, would you need to select? B. B. The, okay, the Hawaiian Islands are southwest. Okay, wait a minute, you said B. It says are southwest. Southwest here, we're talking about, are we talking about a geographic place or are we talking about a direction? It's letter B. We're talking about a, a direction. A direction? Okay, well remember before... No, so it's letter, uh, letter A. Okay, why is that? Because we're talking about a direction. Okay, we are talking about a direction, so we don't need to uh, capitalize direction, so we know we would select version A of the sentence. Okay, Felicia, so you see that there are a variety of rules, and uh, many of them you know, many of them you'll, you'll learn and you'll remember, and um, the best way to to learn them, like I said, is just through memorization and practice and doing these kinds of drills. And that's one of the important things about drills is because we're able to practice some of the rules that, we're, that we uh, normally uh, may not practice or see. Felicia, why don't you help me uh, take just an additional minute to help me with something that Elaine called in today. Would you do that? Is that okay? Yes. Okay, Felicia, thank you. Um, over here on the board, <clears throat> 
Elaine called in with a couple of usage questions. And um, we know usage is very important in writing because we want to be able to correct these errors when we see them in our own writing and also when we're taking maybe standardized tests in language arts. Okay, let's go through and see if we can select the correct um, versions of these sentences. And remember I said at the beginning we're doing a variety of grammar things. Okay, I have a couple of minutes, so let's do this very quickly. Okay, number one, can you see it? No. You can't see that? No. Okay, let me read it for you. Okay, it says, please, okay, we have two versions of the sentence. We have please accept or as please accept this gift as an expression of our thanks. Now, if you saw this sentence, maybe perhaps on a drill or on a test, which word would you choose as being correct? And then we'll talk about what the actual answer is. Which one would, would you choose, Felicia? Accept. Which one, with an A or with an E? Uh, with the A. With an A. Okay, and do you know why? Why would you, why would you choose that? Oh. Uh. What does accept mean? What's the difference between the meanings of these two words here? Accept means to do what? If you're accepting a gift, you are? Taking it. You're taking it. You're receiving it, okay? If I said everyone except Felicia will attend the party, that means everyone what? Besides. Be, okay, it, with the exception of you, that means omitting you, besides you. Very good. So you're right in saying um, except. What about number two? It says please bring or take this package to the main post office. Which, ver which would you choose, bring or take? Take. Okay, take. Okay, why would you say take? Because it's like a person asking you to do something. Okay, and not only that, when we say bring, we're, we mean to come carrying something. Right, When we say mean. take, we mean to go carrying something. Okay, well, I see that my time is up. Felicia, I really appreciate you calling and helping me to go through the capitalization and the usage drills today. And call us anytime you have um, English or math questions, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Call us anytime. My time has expired, but don't go away because uh, there are teachers here to answer all of your homework questions. I'm Deborah Gaines Matthews saying goodbye from everyone at Homework Hotline. Bye bye.